Welcome to Forgotten Waypoints. My name is Brent Smith and today we are going to talk about the recently released interior photos of the Ineos Grenadier and I'm going to talk about what I like and what I dislike about it and let's go have a look. Let's start with the rear seats. And this is what I like about the Grenadier's marketing philosophy. You have this vehicle that screams G-Wagon, and yet for their interior rollout, they show these Recaro seats that look like a hybrid leather vinyl and a heavy cloth or durable canvas seating surface. Personally, I'm a leather fan, but I realize this full leather seating is going to be costly. Also, this hybrid is arguably more rugged. There's really nothing noteworthy about the rear seating area other than you get a good look at the high roof line of the Grenadier and what looks like storage attachment locations that could have a dual function as either a standard clothes hanger or maybe a mounting location for accessories such as an overhead cargo net. The door panel is nothing spectacular, not even leather trimmed, just the same cloth canvas design language. The rear center stack features no electronic controls, but it looks like it's going to have a 230 volt European AC outlet, most likely 110 if it makes it stateside, and the smaller covers are most likely USB. Taking a look back at the cockpit, and it really does resemble a jet plane cockpit, there's a lot to talk about, so let's take a look at the upper center console. On most vehicles, this upper center console area is just simply wasted space. Um, you may have your home link for your garage door opener, light controls, and on my Lexus, I got this useless Lexus link system. You've got the sunroof right here, which prevents you from extending the console back. By having the T-top style moon roofs, Ineos is able to use this space right here for toggle switches. Now, if you look at the photo, some of those aren't really ergonomically placed very well. They're like back here. You know, you'd have to lean back to see what you're trying to toggle. But if you notice the location of the most used ones like the off-road switches, they're right here. In fact, your differential locker switches are inside the two metal posts. I wouldn't be surprised if you're driving, if you could almost see that in your peripheral vision. And so you can just reach up, you can be driving over the trail and say, oh, I need my rear locker and just hit the switch. That is amazing thought there. And then you have the other ones up here and we'll discuss where the layout is and why these back here, I don't think are such a big deal. Also notice the design philosophy here. The buttons are deliberately laid out in a pattern so that you can reach up and feel where the buttons are by the metal hooks or even simply by their placement. There's a lot of space between different groups of buttons. Why is this important? Because you can activate each of these switches without taking your eyes off the road. So it looks like from the photo that the moonroof up top actually has some hinges and clasps to manually undo it from the back and lift it up to get your venting in. It doesn't look like there's any motors there, which is kind of nice, but it is a nice touch that that moonroof can open up. I thought it would just be glass on the top. However, it doesn't look like there's any sort of shade, whether it be a little fabric spin out like on my Discovery 2 or a nice insulated isolator like on a typical sunroof. It needs something. We're out here in the desert. It's super hot. I love my sunroof open on an overcast day at a dusk time, but in the summer in Moab with the sun pounding down, it is just miserable and that stays closed. So Ineos is going to have to show me something on a way to shade those windows or I'm going to have to order mine without it. In this frame from the reveal videos, notice how there is no sunroof here. A no sunroof option is going to be available. Here's that center stack with the differential locker controls located between the metal posts. Unlike the G-Wagon, there is no center differential lock button. We will get to that. We get some nice vehicle measurement information right here, which is a nice touch. Notice it says 84 inches in width. That's got to be with the mirrors, right? A Hummer H2 is only listed at 81 inches and a Jeep Wrangler clocks in at 73. If it truly is 84 inches in width without the mirrors, then it might be a deal breaker for me. Next to the differential lock buttons, we have some interesting off-road controls, simply labeled off-road and waiting. What do these buttons do? Maybe these affect throttle response. Off-road and waiting could give different throttle mappings than the typical highway. 
That could be kind of cool. It's honestly anyone's guess. Located under the assistance group of buttons, we have the familiar electronic stability control and hill descent control buttons, which begs the question if the off-road and waiting buttons control traction control programs or throttle mapping, wouldn't they be lumped in with the assistance buttons too? And finally, it looks like the Grenadier is equipped with a remote SOS service in case of an accident. And in front of this are the interior light controls, manually turning on the overhead lights and controlling the door lights. On the back end of this stack, where it's not the best ergonomically, are the upfitter switches. This is just awesome and proves that the Grenadier is intended from the ground up for aftermarket accessories. You have two switches for the interior. We have a few exterior switches, one of which is 500 amps. Again, this is awesome. You see, most people, when they wire up a winch, they wire it directly to the battery, okay? And that's all fine and dandy, but there is a chance, a slim one, that if you're in an accident, that large heavy amp cable can become shorted to the frame or other metal compartment inside the engine bay, and it can disperse a lot of amperage but not enough to blow the fuse. Essentially, you have a 12 volt welder down there. And in the case of an accident, if it's strong enough, can actually ignite a fire in the engine bay and could be kind of hazardous. But Ineos, with that 500 amp upfitter switch already set up, most likely has an isolator in the engine bay. You put your heavy gauge wires to that and your whole winch assembly on the front is not energized until you flick that toggle, sw toggle switch on the inside of the vehicle. It's very safe. So your really only dangerous section is from the battery to your isolator, which should be really close, rather than from the battery to the winch, which is in the front where the accident occurs. So I was really, really happy to see that 500 amp isolator switch. There's a lot of stuff you can do with that. Well thought out. All of the exterior switches are nice 25 amps, except for a small 10 amp, which would be perfect for small exterior lighting. And it looks like there is a master power switch also. Well thought out, Ineos, well thought out. The top of the center stack isn't much to talk about. There are timeless manual vent controls, which have been in use in vehicles for decades. But I do love the center compass, where most of the manufacturers place a simple clock. Not only is it a great decoration, but the compass actually looks legitimate, unlike those NSWE lights you get on the rear view mirrors that are useless. It even has a digital screen behind it that shows the actual bearing in degrees. That is just too cool. Moving down the center console, you are rewarded with large tactile buttons that look easily manipulated if you are outside working with heavy gloves on. Large seat heater buttons flank the climate controls, which is as simple as it can be. And so at first glance, you might think, oh, the Ineos Grenadier interior scheme is so complicated, like a jet plane with all of these buttons. But as we go through the buttons, you'll realize they're all well thought out and they're all easy to find. In fact, I believe the Ineos Grenadier is going to be one of the most simple, well thought out interior designs of a recently car released. I mean, look at this. This Land Cruiser, which is old by modern standards, that I've got buttons over here that I can't really see. The climate control is really, I can turn it off, but if I want to manually adjust anything like my zones, I've got to do it through the touch screen, which may or might, may not work if my hands are wet. With the Ineos Grenadier, I can just feel heated seat, climate controls. I don't even need to take my eyes off the road and that is a huge advantage. I got the buttons right there. In fact, I love this mute button down in the middle. I mean, you're talking to someone, they bring something up, you're listening to your music or your audiobook, you just mash that mute button. You don't even have to look for it and everything's just kind of temporarily disabled. Hit it again and you're right back where you need to be. It is a very well thought out design and I am just a big fan. The next row shows front windshield and rear window heating. I had a front windshield defroster on my old Range Rover and absolutely loved it. On the other side is your air conditioning master control panel and in the center, protected by the metal posts, is the hazard lights. The bottom row shows a little bit of modern technology with what I thought was a push to start, but it's really the disabling of the automatic start stop for when you're at stoplights. Honestly, I hope this is a toggle switch so that you can leave it off forever. Then there's the ability to turn on and off your park assist, which is really quite handy if you're pulling a trailer. 
In the center is a nice large audio volume dial with an easy to mash mute button, which actually the more I think about it, I think I'm going to use that quite a bit. On this flyby shot, you can see some variation in the machining of the cover plate bolts. I actually like the look, but wonder about how robust they are if you ever needed to remove the panels to get behind and say replace a fan resistor or a damper. I also can't tell if it's plastic or a painted metal. It almost looks rubber. I just hope it holds up to abuse and that the button label paint doesn't flake off like an early 2000s Chevy. It's easy to make things look nice on day one, but some of us keep our rigs for 20 years or buy rigs that are 10 plus years old. So holding up over time is important for this type of SUV, regardless of the price point. That said, I've noticed that this saddle leather option on the steering wheel and the emergency brake handle was designed specifically with vehicle aging in mind. Ineos claims that this saddle leather is going to age and patina with use, and that's kind of a nice touch. Take a look at that lock on the center console, or should I say, center vault. That looks to be about the heaviest duty lock on a console I've ever seen in a vehicle. The gear shift is exactly what you'd find in a BMW, and the biggest letdown for me personally. Maybe it's part of saving money, but I wish Ineos could have had ZF Transmission supply a shifter that looks similar in design language to the rest of the vehicle. This just screams, I borrowed this from BMW! rather than having it designed specifically for the Grenadier. This is just an aesthetic gripe I have. In function, it will do exactly what I need an SUV gear shift to do. Park, reverse, neutral, drive, and most importantly, manually selecting the gears. Critical for low range technical terrain, specifically climbing and descents. Thank you Ineos for giving us an actual tactile shifter and not some gimmicky spin dial on the center console. The transfer case shifter looks great verifying it's indeed a two-speed, full-time, four-wheel drive system. You can shift it in high or low, and in Land Rover fashion, toss it to the left to lock the center differential. What's interesting about this lever is that the center differential lock, or CDL, is on the lever. This suggests to me it's a manually cable-driven range selector. If this is true, this is ideal. You are less likely to have a transfer case failure having a cable shifter for both the range selector and CDL. I've had failure of both the range selector and coder motor and the CDL electronic solenoid actuator on other four-wheel drives. It's not fun. From the still photos, Ineos has teased us with a single infotainment screen. Right here we are in the home menu, which shows some phone contacts and the basic audio. Engine coolant, fuel, gear selection. Come on Ineos, quit teasing us and show us the off-road displays. The driver's section is very unique. There is no gauge cluster, just a tiny display through the steering wheel. I'm hoping it will be customizable and display standard MPH and RPM and the odometer. The rest of the gauges could be shown just fine on the center stack. By keeping the gauge cluster minimalistic, they added this little tray here. This would be a great spot to mount your communication systems and a preferred third-party navigation device. As Grenadier has stated, they're not going to add SatNav to this vehicle because it will most likely be out of date when it's released. It will be compatible with your phones, however. There are typical steering wheel controls and a nice red toot button with a bike on it. This is supposed to give a nice, pleasing horn sound as you pass bicyclists rather than blaring at them and scaring them off the road. It's kind of a nice touch here. On the passenger side, you have a nice tray to hold your phones and electronic devices and a standard glove box that when looked inside doesn't appear to have any USB or charging functionality. In fact, I can't even really see any USB or charging stations in the front of the vehicle. Ineos should consider a way to charge your portable device, especially if you're going to be linking it via Bluetooth to the vehicle for our navigation purposes. Now, from certain views of those interior photos, the cup holders either look like a standard size or maybe slightly bigger. It doesn't look like it could, say, adjust like the Land Cruiser with the slot, even though this isn't the greatest design, but at least I can adjust it so that these bigger vacuum insulated water bottles that most people are using now can fit. You are probably going to have to use a smaller water bottle in the Grenadier. It's not a deal breaker, but something I noticed looking at the interior photos. The cargo compartment at first appears pretty nondescript until you take a good look at it. There's a slotted rail system on each side which seems made for multiple accessories. It will be interesting to see what can come from this. There appears to be attachment points 
or a cargo cover, and your typical cubby for the jack and another for maybe a first aid kit. I do not see any 12 volt power stations in the rear. If this is the case, this needs to be fixed in EOS. For the intended use of this vehicle, we should really have some power in the back and some USBs up front and at least 15 amp upfitter interior switches. This vehicle is supposed to be all about customization. These are some basic things that can go a long way. So that's it. If you made it this far in the video, I appreciate it. Leave some comments below about your thoughts on the interior of the Grenadier. If you guys enjoyed this Car Talk episode, then let me know if we will do another discussing various other aspects of this machine and its development. Thanks, and I hope to see you all on the trail.